The Renaissance was the revival of the ancient world through the spirit of the modern Christian world, and no work better represents this epoch than Raphael's The School of Athens. Plato and Aristotle, the giants of ancient Western philosophy and heroes of Raphael, walk toward us, flanked by a monumental gathering of Greek philosophers in the midst of discussion and the exchange of knowledge. But their faces would have been recognizable to Raphael's contemporaries, perhaps as their own. Now, opposite this is, uh, uh, is the representation of philosophy, and uh, the painting that's come to be known as the School of Athens. And it, it, it's, it's fascinating uh, for all sorts of reasons, uh, not least of them being the presence of the pagan gods in this Christian pope's, uh, in this Christian pope's uh, study. That is, the two big statues in the background, one of them is Apollo, shown there nude with his, with his lyre because he's the god of poetry. And on the other side is the statue of Athena, or as the Romans would have it, Minerva, a kind of warrior goddess of justice um, and wisdom, and above all wisdom. Uh, what Raphael has done here is to create a, um, a, a monumental gathering of Greek philosophers and he set them into a monumental architecture that was inspired by Roman, ancient Roman architecture that is indeed, um, one might say, a model of the new church of St. Peter's that's being designed by his friend Bramante. In fact, the, the ground plan that can be worked out for this painting corresponds exactly to the ground plan of the St. Peter's designed by Bramante. Uh, and we'll see that Bramante enters into this. This is a painting then that celebrates philosophy. Um, like the Disputa across the room, uh, it is geometrically articulated. Down below we have that pavement pattern, a simple rectangular pavement pattern. Uh, here we come up a flight of steps um, to the monumental architecture, to the great um, arches that are coffered in the way of, of the ancient Roman baths. Uh, and we have a series of concentric arches, circles, so that the circle itself, again, dominates up here, but in a very different way. It is not, it is not the absolute circle of heaven that we see across the room. Um, <clears throat> we have a set of, we have a, a, a set of steps that distinguishes a lower zone from a higher zone. And we then have uh, all of these figures, but only two are isolated. Only two are set against the sky, uh, are framed by that background arch. And these, I think there's a detail there that we can look at. Um, those two are what the Renaissance would refer to as the princes of philosophy, of Western philosophy. That is um, Plato and Aristotle. And these, I mean, these are the heroes of this. Everything else radiates from them. Um, and that radiation, as we'll see, is, is extremely important because this is, a, as I said, it's a painting about philosophy, but it's also, it, it extends that philosophical reach right down to the artists, as, as we'll see. Um, what we have are two groups at the very bottom and they are very low. So that the relationship of these two figures to these figures on either side will become something of, of importance. Again, it's, it's a perspective that is the, we can work out the perspective, it's, it's a very rational space, um, and perspective, as you'll see, is very important here. Uh, it is, however, it's the figures themselves that, are, that articulate values. Raphael, for example, takes Plato and Aristotle. How do you, um, how do you differentiate, how does a painter differentiate two philosophies? One points up and one points out. Um, eventually, we, we'll, when we, get to, we can get to their books, uh, Plato holds uh, one of his books, the Timaeus, and Aristotle holds his ethics. But it's exactly that kind of thing. Plato points up, Aristotle points out. Not it doesn't point, he reaches out. Uh, Plato points to that realm of higher ideas. Aristotle reaches out to this realm of human behavior. 
and so what we have is exactly that kind of differentiation. But the two are also known in other ways. Uh, Plato is, uh, after all, he is a, a pure philosopher. Uh, Plato uh, is shown as an older man. He is without decoration. Uh, he stands on bare feet and stands on his toes. So he, he he's already rising off the earth. I mean, reach. I mean, his 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 hand that reaches up and from that finger springs the background arch. So that I mean, they're all they're co totally contained within that that group. Uh, Aristotle, on the other hand, uh, was the philosopher. I mean, after all, he was a philosophical mentor to Alexander the Great. He's the philosopher of the court. Uh, he has, uh, in many ways, he's entered into the world, and he is very much a man of the world. Plato's beard is long and unkempt. Aristotle, is, is, it, Aristotle has just seen the barber. He's very well, well uh, trimmed. Um, Aristotle's robe is, uh, first of all, it's a much more expensive blue than, than the, the red of, of, of Plato, but it's, it's edged, it's trimmed in gold. He wears gold-trimmed sandals, and he stands flat on the ground, so he's very much a figure of this world. The d fundamental difference is Plato's verticality and, and Aristotle's horizontality. And these, these will continue. Um, and once again, this is, this is a painter thinking, one might say even thinking um, geometrically, just in terms of vertical and horizontal, but, uh, but this then continues down below. I mean, not all of these figures can be identified, although lots of effort has been taken. One in particular can, that's Socrates. I mean, his portrait is known, and here he is arguing. I mean, and this is, again, this is, he's really making his points. This is the logic of Socrates. And he's arguing with a, a, a young foppish uh, uh, figure in, in armor, and that, of course, can only be his favorite, um, Alcibiades. Down below, however, it becomes even more interesting. Uh, the Platonic the division is between a Platonic side and a, an Aristotelian side. Uh, the Platonic side is to the is, is to the what we could call the Dexter side of the painting. That is looking out from the painting. So this would be the privilege. This is the side that is privileged in the case of Christ. Um, opposite in the disputa, the central axis is where the, the meaning of the painting is carried. In the School of Athens, there is no central axis. It's a division between two sides. So there, I mean, two very fundamentally different structures, even though they have this, this similarity. I mean, even the two columns up here um, are paired in the same way that the two philosophers here are paired. And then there are the pairings on either corner. Um, down here is a group of figures around a bald man who leans down with a pair of compasses and is demonstrating something on a slate. And that, of course, is Euclid, um, the geometer, Euclid. Uh, on the other side, um, another bald man, again, surrounded by, by, by disciples. I mean, the, the whole notion of pedagogy is, is very important in, the, in this culture. Uh, and in front of him is held a, uh, another slate, which has the um, diagram of harmonic proportions that was discovered by Pythagoras. So we have Pythagoras, and Euclid. We have the, um, the order of forms and here the order of numbers, which is higher than form because what, what these numbers represent is the harmony of the universe, the harmony of the spheres. That is that higher realm to which Plato is pointing. So that in, once again, what we have is, is a very interesting um, um, but subtle contrast. Plato holds his book um, vertically. The slate of Pythagoras is held up, but not quite vertically, just at, a, at an angle, but it's held up off the ground. Aristotle holds his book horizontally. The lowest uh, uh, object in the, in the entire painting is the slate on the ground, flat on the ground, on which Euclid performs his demonstration. And he's surrounded by figures here. I mean, the figures that he's surrounded by are um, Probably the um, uh, astronomers and um, like, well, clearly the one with the, with the crown is the royal astronomer, the, that is the king astronomer uh, Ptolemy, and uh, the the figure holding the astrolabe is probably probably 
uh, the Greek uh, geographer Strabo, uh, although other, other identifications have been put forth. But they both refer to astronomy and, and to the, ge the geography of the Earth. Uh, then there are these two portraits here in the corner. One of them is a self-portrait. Raphael puts himself into this. This figure looking out at us is Raphael. And this takes us back once again to that long tradition of the 15th century in which mathematics was the basis of, of painting. Raphael, of course, as a master of, of perspective, is a mathematician in that ray. Uh, and the entire perspective depends absolutely, ultimately, for its mathematics on, on Euclid. And Euclid carry, uh, on, on Euclid's, um, on, on the collar of Euclid's dress, uh, Raphael signs himself, I mean, with, by his initials, Raphael Urbino. Uh, so he identifies with Euclid, and probably that bald head belongs to Raphael's friend and mentor, the architect Bramante. So it's, it becomes very personalized. This is, this is the, this is the artist, the painter rather, uh, associating himself, associating his art with philosophy through mathematics. On the other side, where this world of, of harmonic proportions and so forth, um, originally Raphael didn't have this figure and he added it later. He came back and added it. He filled it in. Um, this figure is unlike all the others. Raphael's figures are open. Raphael's figures discourse with one another. I mean, this is, this is what Vasari meant when he said that Raphael came to, came, was, was sent to Earth to instruct these uncouth artists in social values. And Raphael's figures are constantly dealing with one another, they're debating with one another, they're talking, they're gesturing. And there's a lightness about them. I mean, just at this point in his career, I mean, this is, I mean Raphael is always young in effect, but at this point in his career, there, there's, there's no, none of the heavy ponderation that one finds in, in Michelangelo, except for that figure. This is a figure uh, who can be recognized I mean, by his pose as a melancholic. Uh, as a melancholic philosopher, that would make him Heraclitus, the ancient Greek philosopher. But he's also pretty much the only figure who's wearing boots. Um, he's also the only figure who is totally wrapped up in himself alone. Um, he's holding a pen, waiting to write. He's leaning on a block of stone, already cut stone. Uh, this is a figure who is inspired by a figure of, by Michelangelo up on the Sistine ceiling, but it's also a portrait of Michelangelo. It is Raphael's tribute to Michelangelo. Ra Michelangelo was always jealous of, of Raphael. Raphael knew the master. He knew, um, he knew that this was, this was an artist of incredible magnitude. And um, he, one can say here that he basically paid a profound tribute to Michelangelo. Um, he recognized Michelangelo's own personality. He also recognized something else that comes out in, later in, in, in um, uh, in the biographies of Michelangelo, that is later in the 16th century, that is he always wore his dogskin boots. Uh, and so all of this makes it, makes it clear. But it's more important than just Raphael's own tribute to another artist, because he also defines that artist, just as he defined himself here, in effect, as belonging, in, as it were, to an older tradition of the rational basis of painting, painting as mathematics. Something is different here. Um, it, this is not where art comes from math. This is where art comes from something higher. This is where, and this is the Michelangelo who's also already known as a poet. This is Michelangelo sitting there you know, brooding, holding his pen, waiting for inspiration, waiting to hear that higher voice. Um, this is something that everybody learned about. I mean, that is among cultured a cultured society, the whole idea of inspiration that is, um, was, was fairly commonplace in the sense that all the prophets of the Old Testament are, I mean, they don't speak their own language, uh, they don't speak their own words, they speak the words of God. Or the sibyls in, um, in, in Greek and Roman literature, uh, the sibyls don't 
speak their own words. What I mean, you go to the Sybil precisely because she will give you the word of God or the God, one of the gods, Apollo, usually. Uh, so that there is this whole sense in which um, there's a new value being brought into, as I mentioned before, being brought into um, the, the very notion of artistic creativity, and that's inspiration. And this Michelangelo had worked out on the Sistine ceiling, absolutely. The alternating figures of the, of the Sibyls and the prophets, um, you can enact inspiration there, uh, where the, the figure that is probably most immediately relevant here is Michelangelo's figure of Jeremiah, who sits brooding up on the Sistine ceiling, also with legs crossed so he can't move. And the next stage, as it were, of inspiration would be the figure of would be the figure of Isaiah, uh, who has moved from this kind of pose to this, so that his hand is still there, but his, he has turned away, looking over his shoulder, and behind him are genii. No, no, no this is Michelangelo, uh, looking to that higher source. All of this is something that is encapsulated in this figure, a figure who is awaiting that kind of inspiration. This is the tribute to Michelangelo, but it also takes what was the objectivity of painting as a liberal art in the sense of mathematics, it takes that and transforms it into some, to the subjectivity of poetry, for which there are no mathematical rules and, and which you're waiting for waiting for inspiration, that is to be filled with the word or the breath of God. And this is, as I said, this is a, an even more profound aspect of Raphael's tribute to Michelangelo.